Because my rebuttal statement to the job market is cut is that people are still getting jobs regardless of the job market being cut. It's changed from getting into companies and going through training. We're, we're now in a space where you kind of have to train yourself up. Follow up multiple times. They'll either reply to you and tell you F off or they'll block you. So two years ago, I attended this event, BTF. And if you've been watching the channel long enough, you'd have seen my vlog from two years ago where I was walking around, checking out robots, interviewing people, and just having lots of fun at this event. Well, two years later, I'm attending the event again, but this time around, I'm honored to be a part of it. I joined an amazing panel of professionals and founders of companies and organizations that help people get their first jobs, not just in tech, but in various industries. In our panel, we discussed how to get to your first job, and there were so many gems shared. So I'm gonna share that with you in this video. And if you're on the journey of seeking your first role, by the end of this video, you will be more clear on the techniques and the mindset you need to achieve that goal. In this video, you will also get a feel for what set conferences like BETF are like. And finally, at the end of this video, I have a huge announcement. So stick around. Good morning, everyone. We're thrilled to have you here at BTF 25. In a few minutes, we'll be kicking off our first session. The ladder is still there. How to get that first role. We have our lovely panelists today, and we're going to be talking about how to secure your first gig in the corporate world, or potentially pivot into another role from a different industry. I'll kind of kickstart by, by saying a term that we're all familiar with, which is the job market is cooked. That's the only thing I see on my FYP every single day. The job market is cooked, the job market is cooked, the job market is cooked. Starting with you, Caleb, what would be your rebuttal to someone that comes to you and says, ah, oh, the job market is cooked? What is your rebuttal to them? Firstly, uh, it is very difficult to secure roles. It has always been difficult, but it seems like it's the next level right now. And right now, I believe we're in a skills-based job market. And so for those candidates trying to get their first role specifically, it's changed from getting into companies and going through training. You know, a company will, will take you in, train you up. And we're, we're now in a space where you kind of have to train yourself up and go after those skills. Even though you don't have experience, the cheat code to getting experience is going out, doing projects, and finding that experience for yourself and, and packaging it in a way that you can say, I do have experience in this thing, even though I haven't worked in it. I would say, but you can do it. I would say have faith in yourself. I think it's it's been cooked in different ways for every generation in some way, shape or form. Right. Um, and they all overcame it, so you can do the same thing. Within the Black Apprentice Network, we had a, we have around 5,000 people and around 250 got roles last year. Mm. And I would say with the 250 people, most of them we already recognized at the beginning of the year, or as the year went on, that they were already going to get roles because of the, the way that they carry themselves. Mm. So I think it's just about making sure that you align yourself to what the job market is looking for, right? I think our panelists are very, very kind, right? Because my rebuttal statement to the job market is cut is that people are still getting jobs, regardless of the job market being cut. And that's just the reality of the situation. So anybody that comes to me, that's the first thing I'm always going to tell them. Yes, the job market is cooked, but people are still getting jobs. In a cooked job market, be the one that finds out all the relevant things that you need to find out in order to get a job and not be cooked. You need to be cooking in the job market. That's essentially what you need to do. In a bad economy where no money is being made, be the person that finds out, yo, how do we make money in a bad economy? And hopefully today, that's essentially what we're going to kind of go through and find out. You did a degree apprenticeship for a very competitive organization, Salesforce, right? And you were quite young, you know, going into a degree apprenticeship. A big thing that I kind of see with a lot of candidates like that are very young at the moment, it's kind of like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to actually pick, like what am I supposed to do? So, you know, if we could kind of go back in time and rewind to your experience, what were the steps that you took to kind of figure out like, okay, cool, I'm going to apply for this degree apprenticeship at Salesforce. Like what was your thought process as like a sixth form student? Like where did you start? How did you even get to that? Okay, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, I remember, you know, midway through kind of year 13, I was going to apply to university and I was going to go to Warwick, but then I understood and I read it in a book somewhere. I wanted to kind of make sure I learned skills to make sure that once I graduate from my degree apprenticeship, I'll be able to be hired based on my skills, but not solely based on my potential. So having that skills approach. Mm. So I think, um, so I think at that time, and I think it um, is even more true now, I think it's just about making sure that you put yourself in the right position to learn the right skills. Even if you're going to a university, like are you kind of making sure that your degree is allowing you to learn, learn skills that are going to be valuable within the workplace? 
and that's one of the reasons why I'm a bit biased, but you know, I do really like apprenticeships because you want to be able to learn skills which is specifically valuable to the organization in which you're working with within. And um, the way that the program and you know was structured and out of my own initiative, I made time and I made um, situations where I'm able to kind of learn different skills, able to learn different skills that allow me to be on different projects, learn different skills that if I was to kind of leave Salesforce and join an uh, organization which you know, needed similar skills, I was able to kind of go into that organization and be valuable. So I think the name of the game is just understand the market, understand that you want to learn different skills because skills are going to be the things that make you valuable nice. in any sort of environment. You're a really clued up sixth former because I can tell you when I was 18 years old, I was not thinking skills, skills, skills. Personally, guys, my approach when it came to picking like my first job was just not to be crass, but effing around and finding out. Right, and ultimately, what I mean by that is that look, when you're trying to get your foot in the door, that is ultimately the most important thing, right? So, really and truly, it's really as simple as just looking at what's available, seeing what piques your interest to a certain extent, and then basically going for it. Because the fact of the matter is that you have your whole career ahead of you, and you have multiple times to be able to change careers, right? So, ultimately, it's about okay, how do we kickstart this process rather than over analyzing and overthinking? And I think. I don't know, as an uninformed 18-year-old, that was definitely my mindset kind of going into it. I don't think I was as informed as like a lot of young people are today in terms of like, you know, skills, AI and stuff like that. It was just, who is hiring? What seems interesting? Can I apply? I don't know if Caleb, you can kind of provide any insight into like why you picked tech or like your first role. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I had a mentor who kind of worked in the cloud, uh, cloud computing space and I kind of followed his lead and took a real interest in what he did and started to do my own research. I started to do like certifications on that thing to, to understand it a little bit more. I started to do, uh, to, to watch a lot of uh, YouTube videos and stuff around that specific thing. And I think the fact that, you know, my net wasn't super widespread and I had kind of a specific sort of niche that I was going for, you know, when it came to interviews for those roles, they kind of saw that, okay, my CV kind of aligns with it and there's sort of an interest even though I don't have that experience yet. So niching down really helped me to sort of focus on exactly what I wanted to do and get ahead of other people trying to break into that same industry. How did you kind of go about of even securing a mentor in the first place? Because I don't know, from my perspective, I feel like mentorship is like a very overused word and sometimes a lot of people overcomplicate it. So it'd be great to understand the young 18 year old or 21 year old coming out of uni Caleb how did you figure out okay cool how do I get a mentor um so funny enough I met my mentor in church like it's just in, it's just a random guy who works in tech who I just met who I asked a few questions um like you said mentorship is over complicated anyone could be your mentor you know I like and it doesn't have to be a relationship where you sit down and figure out and write down how you're going to go about something it could be just someone that you know is in the position you want to be in and then you ask them questions right so there are various ways that you can have mentors. It's not just that one-to-one -one relationship where you're spending 30 minutes every week. It's it's much broader than that. I'm going to be super honest. I think when you said, was it F around and find out or something like that, I think that's a legit strategy sometimes. Um, I was very much just applying for every job that I could see, like every vacancy that I could see. I studied languages, nothing to do with tech, right? I love languages. And the only job offer I got out of like 100 applications, I'm still salty, was for a tech grad scheme. I'm glad I got the, the offer, obviously. But it was awesome. So I think I kind of fell into tech, and I think that's a lot of people's stories, especially I'm in user experience, which is quite a sort of um, sort of touchy-feely, very human side of tech. It's a lot about empathy. It's a lot about sort of soft skills, those sort of things. But actually, as a linguist, I had a lot of transferable skills because as a linguist, I studied cultures, different cultures, humans, people, how to interact with people in different languages, lived abroad for a year, really understood how to like read people. And that's what I do in my career. Like That's what I did in my first job, and that's what I do now. So um, I think coming back to what you said about like getting skills at, at uni, it's it's not just about you know knowing the degree that you want to do and having like a set path and knowing you want to go into tech and going to do a tech focused degree and you're going to go into tech for your first role. Sometimes it's do what you love, f around and find out, have fun on the way, and then things will like fall into place for you. Thankfully, the first job that I did get it was a tech grad scheme at MS and I had so much fun. I had a rotation in user experience. Absolutely fell in love with it. I was like, I found my calling. This is me for life, um, and I'm still in it six years later. There was a real comment that I saw, and someone was like. Look, all these tips and um, all these tips and everything you guys are saying are great, but I can't even get an interview right now. Like, I can't get an interview. Like, you guys are telling me, oh yeah, this is how you navigate the interview process and stuff like that. No one's even get, calling me back for an interview. 
Are there some unconventional, unique ways in today's day and age that you guys are like seeing is really effective when it comes to landing interviews? Caleb, I feel like you hinted at a few things here and there, so maybe you might have a bit of insight into this. Man, um, so uh, a recent podcast that I did with uh, uh, a lead uh, DevOps engineer, and, and he helps people get into the DevOps space, and he spoke about this technique, which was really unique, really interesting, and basically, I don't know if you guys have ever um, seen like Loom, the the, uh, the app Loom, where you you know do recordings yeah, yeah, yeah. and you record your face and screen recordings. So he did a Loom of his CV next to the job description and was telling and sent it to the recruiter saying, "Oh, this is the job description and this is my CV and this is how it applies." No way. Hey, Carl. Hope you're keeping well. I'm sure you've never been reached out to in this format by a candidate before. But I came across this senior cloud automation engineer role. Let me walk you through why I think I'm a good fit for the role. Relevant certifications that they might be looking for. I have all three. Certified Kubernetes Administrator, Certified Solution Architect Associate. The role involves optimizing cloud infrastructure for AWS Azure and Google Cloud. And that, you know, when you're working in that sort of multi-cloud environment, it genuinely, generally sort of insinuates that you're heading towards using Terraform as much as possible as it's cloud agnostic and provides those benefits, having that templated approach and deploying to different cloud providers. That's, what's, that's what Terraform is about, right? So appreciate your time. Hopefully you could get back to me in regards to the role. And so he was using that unique way and he managed to get about three job offers in Dubai uh, using that technique. It was really interesting, really cool, and it was a unique thing that no one was doing. That's really tough, and I actually use that, I, I use that method in my current business right now. Every time I send a client a proposal, I always record a loom to kind of give a bit more context, because sometimes on meetings, people will forget, and I feel like context is really important. I liken this to the fact that in previous job markets, you would be expected to apply for a job just based off of where the job description. But now, as you guys can see here, all these companies are here to basically sell you on why they should apply, and why you should apply for their jobs, right? So they're giving you further context. So I think finding like ways like that to basically provide further context into your role um, and like what you do in your relevant experience could really like help you stand out in that respect. Said adding the human element to your application. Um, so if, whether that's a loom or whether that's your CV, you can make it stand out by linking, putting in a URL at the, at the top to your LinkedIn recommendations. And you can be like, don't take my word for it before you even get into my competencies and my work experience with the rest of my CV. Here's a little bio and a little link to my LinkedIn. Scroll down, you can see the recommendations that colleagues that have worked with me have given me. Mm. So every job that you're in, and even before you're, because we're talking about first job, right? So societies, if you're at uni and you're leading in the society committee, or if you've got volunteering experience and you've worked with anyone, get them to give you a LinkedIn recommendation. Mm. Build up that reputation because it's a very human sort of, like word of mouth, it's kind of like verbatim how you are to work with. And a lot of the time people want to hire people, not necessarily that are best for the role, but who they can see themselves working with. And that's just the way that's the world the works, right? Do it, do it, do it. Follow up multiple times. Because look, one of two things will happen. They'll either reply to you and tell you F off. Yeah? Which is good, because then you know you don't need to reach out to them again. Or they'll block you. Yeah? And I usually have a rule of thumb, yeah? I basically have a five, five stage process, basically, of reaching out. If you don't reply to me after five times, yes, I take the hint, yeah? So you have your own method, basically. But honestly, outreach is so slept on and underrated. I think your TED talk on this was really, really cool. You likened thinking of your career as a business. What are just quick fire um, points, key business skills that you need to have basically in relation to like the job market? Yeah, so the first one is marketing and marketing is basically setting up your LinkedIn, setting up your uh, CV in a creative way that attracts people, right? So you think of a business, you think of the marketing they do, think of the Apple, think of um, adverts on TV, they want to attract people to them. So for us, marketing is setting up our LinkedIn profiles and that sort of thing. And the second thing is sales. So when you talk about sales and you think about salesmen, they go and they message hundreds of people trying to find customers, but not just anyone. They're looking for people uh, who they can kind of match. And so for us, it's getting the skills to match the people we're applying to. So we need to find out what's on the job description, what that, that company is looking for, match those skills with sales and outreach. Okay, sales and marketing, right? Marketing to really get out there so that people can find you, and sales to basically convince the relevant people. And I'll end by saying the job market is cooked, but we've got to get cooking, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the session. So beats.
ATF done. Had a great time at this event. Out here with my brother Ben. Ben, talk to them, man. Talk to them. ETF 2025. If you weren't there, you missed it. Yes, for sure. Had a really great time today. Good uh, talk. And um, yeah, next year be here. So here's the announcement that you've been waiting for. A lot of you have watched the Tech Certified Podcast on this channel. In fact, for a lot of you watching this, it's probably the way that you found out about this YouTube channel. I've interviewed over 30 guests who work in tech and have been able to help other people in their tech careers. It's one of my favorite things on this channel. And here comes the news. This November, I will be launching season three of the Tech Certified Podcast. It is already underway. I have up to 15 amazing guests lined up. So stick around on the channel this November and if you're not subscribed already, you know what to do. And if you found value in this video, then you will enjoy this one.